Hey, deserving listeners, today we're going to talk about perfectionism. Perfectionism is a really difficult thing for people. It can cause all sorts of problems for people in their lives. Things like lack of motivation, low self-esteem, anxiety, and worrying about things being perfect. It can even lead to eating disorders, um, difficulties in school with being able to actually pr- turn things in for f- fear of it not being perfect. It can lead to depression, other mood disorders. It can lead to imposter syndrome, feeling like you're just an imposter, faking like you're good at something. And with all that stress, you can become burnt out with something because you're trying all the time to be perfect and it will burn you out. And you just say, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And this, it can even lead to suicide. Perfectionism has been linked with actually dying. So perfectionism can, in essence, kill people. You know, it's really rough. It's a really rough experience uh, for the most part. And of course, the internet is full of bad information about perfectionism. The internet loves to distort our psychological concepts. When it comes to perfectionism, the internet seems to think that it's just, you know, liking things to be in order or preferring uh, um, to be organized or something. And certainly that can be an element of perfectionism. But as I've, you know, mentioned, perfectionism can be much more difficult than, than just uh, a preference for things being in order. And of course, if you're a famous person or a famous performer and you're particular about your performances being good, then the internet will label you as a perfectionist. You know, people like Madonna or something. It's like she cares about her shows and therefore she's a perfectionist. Barbra Streisand, this kind of thing. Um, and it's, it, all that talk on the internet just really, I think, demeans the experience of actual humans. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about perfectionism and kind of uh, go through all the different aspects of it and the different levels and uh, some there's there's beneficial forms of perfectionism and 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 also d- destructive by the way this episode is a, a patron only episode but i have a few things to say before we get to the patron zone uh, i want to talk about myself in this episode so you know i i sometimes struggle with perfectionism myself uh, for example, when it comes to this podcast, there are times when I'm doing a deep dive, like like with this episode, and I will be, you know, researching and talking and thinking and reading and writing and, um, you know, just that whole process, and it, you know, takes a long time. And there's a lot of twists and turns in the researching of things. You know, each each one of these topics. I will kind of know a little bit about, but in order to do a a really good episode or the sort of episode that I think I'm capable of or the sort of episode that I think the listeners deserve, I really set my mind on producing something that I think is like, you know, perhaps the best episode that's ever been made in in the podcasting world on a particular topic. And I know that's super grandiose, but I did, you know, there's just not a lot of podcasters who have the luxury, like I do, to dedicate all the time necessary to, to, to do something as, as um, comprehensive, I should say. Maybe not the best episode on perfectionism, but, but like the, the most comprehensive. I'm a very comprehensive perfectionist. Uh, I, I need to read every single research article, every book, everything online. I need, to, I need to read everything that's ever been produced about a particular topic before I make an episode about it. And when it comes to that process, like I said, there's a lot of twists and turns in that. And I need to keep my motivation up because at any time I could just be like, okay, I'm not going to do this. I'll just do something easier or or even I'll just stop doing the podcast altogether. You know, I, I there's there's no... No one employs me to do this. I just, I do this on my own. And uh, at any time I could just pull the plug or at the very least I could slow down and just be like, ah, you know, let's put less effort into this. It's, it's sort of hard to do all this stuff. And so to spend, you know, eight, 12 hours a day, just reading and researching and writing, you need to keep your motivation up. And one of the things that keeps my motivation up is this 
this drive to produce something that is, like I said, comprehensive, that that really fully encapsulates a particular topic. And there are times in the winding road getting there that I will become quite confused. <laughs> there will be times when I wonder, what am I doing? Or do I really understand this concept? Or how much work is this going to actually take? <laughs> you know, because sometimes these episodes will take months of, of my time to research. And, you know, there are times when you have a, a bad mood moment. And in those moments of bad mood and, you know, demoralization, I, I have this vision in my head, a sort of uh, unspoken vision of this episode just being really bad. I, I just, I have this image of like, oh, this episode is going to be not perfect. It is going to be mediocre. People are going to listen to this episode and think, oh, Kirk, uh, nice try, but you, you know, you really missed the mark here. <laughs> I, and, you know, I get feedback like that sometimes, so it's not like it's inconceivable. And I, uh, in those moments, because of my perfectionism, it will feel very bad to me. It will, uh, my mood will plummet, my motivation will plummet, and I will suddenly be, I'll be staring at the computer screen, and I'll just be like, what am I doing with my life? I, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm... I'm trying to do something that I will fail at. I'm going to fail. This is going to be awful. And I, I, I will just stop. I can't go on. I, you know, I have that burnout feeling. I have that giving up feeling of just like, why am I, do, why am I trying to make something? You know, it's sort of like um, a similar experience that I have with this is when it comes to cooking. I'm not very good at cooking. And so there are times when every once in a while where I'll be tasked with cooking something and I'll be in the middle of cooking something and I'll just be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know what temperature things should be. I don't know what a pinch of salt exactly means. I don't know when meat is actually cooked all the way through. So what am I doing here? I, I shouldn't be here. And that, that's that feeling when I run into you know uh, that uh, down that valley of motivation and uh, with the with developing a podcast episode. And that's perfectionism. You know, that this, it's sort of the, the yin and yang of perfectionism, which is that perfectionism can be beneficial for people and for me in that when I am in the zone and things are going well, I am highly motivated to produce what. I believe to be the the closest thing to perfect I can make, the most comprehensive, the most uh, well instructive episode that's ever been made on a topic. Now, of course, that's ridiculous because um, I haven't consumed every single thing that's ever been made on a topic. But 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 sometimes I, I literally believe that you know it's just like you know podcasting is fairly new. Of course, in fifty years, if there are still podcasts there will be so many other psychological podcasts that will surpass me, of course. But, but right now, you know, it's, it's still kind of in the wild west, you know, think of like early radio days in the thirties or something. It, it, it's still possible now to produce like the quintessential episode on a particular topic. And so, so anyway, that, that motivates me. I'm like, Oh man, you know, I, I can do this. Look at, you know, all this stuff that I, have and I have all this stuff available to me and I'm privileged with my time and the, the patrons are paying money and they, you know, I, I, I can take money away from my regular job and really dedicate to this particular topic. You know, what a great thing. I'm going to, I'm going to produce this monument of, of an episode to a particular topic. You know, again, it's super grandiose, but it, it, it that's what motivates me. You know, it, that, that's a, 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 that gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to, to produce that kind of stuff. It feels good. And so that's the perfectionism that helps me, that the striving for a perfect product. And of course, I always know it's never perfect. I mean, I can already just think in the however long I've been talking to you so far, 10 minutes or so, that I've already screwed up several things. I've stuttered, I've misspoke, I've regretted certain word choices. So it's not like it's perfect, but but I hope you get my meaning. It's like a, a high motivation to make something that is of high quality, not, not only to me, but to other people as well. So, 
so that's the good side of perfectionism. But then when I run into self-doubt and those voices start to come into your head, you know, just like, this is going to be crappy. Everyone's going to see how stupid this is. Uh, you'll never be able to make the most you know, perfect episode. It's not possible. You don't know how to do this. What are you doing? And then the motivation just completely drops out from underneath me and, and I go falling and I'm just like, what am I doing here? And I walk away. Now, I've been doing this podcast for over 10 years and so I've had these moments so many times that I know immediately what's happening and that is is that, oh, I'm, I'm just running into the bad side of perfectionism and I just need to take a break. And if I take a break, however long it takes, sometimes it just means like a half an hour or something. But sometimes it's like a day or two or even a week. And in that time, it's sort of like my brain resets or something and I, I forget what was the premise behind my demoralization and I come back to it. Um, or fresh eyes looking at something. Or, or sometimes it, it's, it's just saying to me, myself later, you know, a couple days later, just saying like, well, you know, look, it's not going to be the best episode. There's probably dozens of other podcast episodes by other people that are better than this. But you know what? Uh, I, I really want to do it anyway, and I'm going to do it, even, even though this episode's going to be mediocre. So, so in that way, I, through my therapy and through my own contemplation and self-care, have learned to uh, stay on the beneficial side of perfectionism and, uh, you know, to, to sort of stave off the negative side of perfectionism. So, so that's, you know, perfectionism. <laughs> um, and I'm going to get into the pros and cons of perfectionism more later. So I want to tell a story about a client who suffered from perfectionism as a way of bringing this into to the clinical world. So, uh, and as, all, as always, whenever I talk about clients, I always mask their identity to protect their confidentiality. This is a teenage Asian girl, and, and her presenting problem was that she was breaking rules at home. She was talking back to her parents. She was, um, her grades weren't doing so great. She was skipping school. She was hanging out with different sort of crowd, um, caught shoplifting. She would state that she suffered from anxiety. And her parents forced her into therapy, and she wasn't very enthusiastic about therapy at, at first. So it took me a while to build a relationship with her, with some teenagers like this and children. It can take a long time. You really have to spend, even if they're talkative and quite polite in therapy, it, it can take, well, it can, it's, it can take a long time for anyone, frankly, to, d to develop a relationship, particularly for people who are being forced into therapy. And at first I thought, you know, well, you know, this therapy situation, she doesn't really seem to want anything. We're working on things kind of, but not really. But then she had a crisis. She had a breakup with a boyfriend and she also, during that time, was experiencing a lot of bullying at school, and this resulted in her uh, resorting to cutting, uh, non-suicidal self-injury, and she was caught by her father uh, cutting in the bathroom. And her, her father, you know, was, her family was very alarmed, and, and she was very alarmed too. She, you know, in that moment kind of had a wake-up call of just like, man, I... I probably should be talking with my therapist more openly about my life. And so she opened up and she talked about how she was suffering deeply, really, and that she had been cutting to cope with deep insecurities and deep feelings of loneliness. Now, she had some borderline traits, but she wasn't high on, this, on the spectrum, um, as evidenced by her ability to trust me fairly quickly after the crisis. Um. And she told me more about her life. And so I'm thinking, okay, we're getting somewhere in therapy. You know, she's opening up. I'm, I'm glad that she's doing that. And I eventually discovered that she has been spending a lot of time on social media, particularly Instagram. And she told me that she was basically semi-famous in the teen Instagram world as someone who knew a lot about hair and makeup and fashion and this kind of stuff. Um... And even though she had attained some fame, she was constantly thinking about how 
she could be more famous. In her mind, she wanted to have the most famous, or I don't know the term, the, the most liked, the most shared, the most followed Instagram feed of all time when it came to fashion and makeup and hair and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, like other super famous Instagram people like the Kardashians or something or Jenners. And it was all that she thought about. I mean, certainly there's a lot of people who think about that, but she thought about it a lot. And there were times when she felt very good about herself after getting some sort of accolade online, you know, like, I don't know, one of the Kardashians or Jenners following her on Instagram or something. But, but really more often she was feeling deeply inferior and she was deeply suffering. She hated the way she looked. She thought she was too fat. She thought she was ugly. She thought her nose looked too Asian. And all of this uh, negativity towards herself would, you know, sort of cause her to ruminate on what she was doing on Instagram. And she would have moments like me, it was, it was sort of more exaggerated, where she'd be like in the zone and and she'd be, you know, making Instagram posts and doing little videos and stuff. And, and everything was going well for her because she was getting a lot of accolades. And then there are other moments where she, you know, thought, I am, I'm imperfect. I'm ugly. What am I doing here? Not enough people follow me. Uh, and she would have, her motivation would just plummet. And she would think about um, completely closing your Instagram account altogether, which for some of us is not a big deal. But for her, that was like, you know, a really big move. And so this was something that was really consuming to her. And again, similar to me, she would have positive moments and negative moments. But uh, dissimilar to me, she experienced 99% of the time she was experiencing some sort of negative suffering as a result of this perfectionistic loop that she was in. And so the therapy with her involved helping her to see this process for what it was. And the temptation that I had at first was just to tell her, like, just close your Instagram account. This is stupid. Because I don't use Instagram. I, I Every once in a while, someone will motivate me to do Instagram and um, I had a marketing person actually tell me recently, like, oh, you got to be on Instagram. And I'm like, oh, okay, fine. And I sort of dabbled in it for like five seconds. And I was like, oh, Instagram, it's such a weird interface. <laughs> um, uh, like you can't use your computer. You have to use your phone. And it's just like, why? Anyway. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so from my perspective, I'm just like, just close your Instagram account. Like, you know, if it's causing you so much problems, you know, just move on. But that is a simplistic way of looking at things. It's sort of like when we look at people who are complaining about their spouses or something, you know, they're having a lot of really bad experiences and, and fighting with their spouse. And you're just like, well, just divorce, just divorce your husband, you know, move on in life. And, you know, and there are a lot of therapists that engage in that sort of simplistic life changing decisions as a way of solving your problems. And, that wouldn't solve her problem, right? She's a perfectionistic person. And so if it wasn't Instagram, it would just be something else. And also there's a lot of benefits to her using Instagram. Like for me, for with the podcast, I suffer sometimes with my perfectionism when it comes to the podcast. But uh, during those suffering times, if someone said like, well, just stop the podcast, I'd be, be like, geez, you really just don't understand the bigger picture here. So I uh, quickly realized that that's a simplistic way of looking at it. I'm not going to tell her to, to stop doing Instagram. And so the, the trick was, how do we help her uh, with her Instagram sort of fame or use or, or enjoyment and not have her suffer as a result, right? And so what it involved was um, helping her to understand where her thoughts are coming from be aware of where emotions are coming from, being aware of this of the sort of cognitions that she has about failure and about um, uh, you know making mistakes. And also another part of it, uh, eventually, and I'll get more into the treatment later, involved helping her to um, actually just expose herself to making mistakes. So one of the things that we did was I just had her post things on Instagram that were terrible. 
that like emphasized her nose, you know, like were bad angles of her, of her nose or bad angles of her face or uh, were, um, you know, her, when her hair looked bad or something, you know, and, and she took to it pretty quickly. She's like, oh, okay. And so, you know, as she did that, she's like, oh, I get it. Like my idea of failure is actually not accurate. My idea of making a mistake is actually not accurate. I thought that failure was the worst. I thought that um, showing my nose was a mistake, but in reality, it's not. <laughs> like it's it's okay. It's fine. And sure, some of the things that I post aren't going to get as much love and attention as other things. But who cares? What's what is the what's the focus of my life? And this is where existential therapy comes in, which is just like what is the purpose of my life? Is the purpose of my life to suffer and toil over Instagram? Or is it something else? And once people actually establish what that something else is, then it puts things into perspective. Okay, so let's go into the definition. Again, we're going to go to the patron zone soon, but I just want to go over the definition and prevalence here for a second. So what's the definition of perfectionism? So there are a lot of definitions of perfectionism in the literature, and it's not a DSM diagnosis. So therefore, it doesn't have a lot of precise definitions in the clinical clinical literature. So, um, but it, it is fairly, it is a fairly well-researched construct and does have a lot of definitions out there, but it's unclear exactly where the line is between what, you know, with, with someone that ha- has perfectionism and someone that doesn't, if that makes any sense. But really in my book, all, all things psychology related are like that, uh, or most things I should say you know, like narcissism, it's like, where's the line between you having narcissism and not, it, it's, it's debatable. Anyway, perfectionism, uh, the definition is a personality disposition. So, so sometimes the, the uh, uh, literature will talk about it as a personality disposition or a temperament or a trait or um, just a, a style of living. So just keep that in mind. But anyway, Perfectionism is characterized by three different things. One is exceedingly high standards of your own performance. So with the client, she needed her Instagram to be perfect and she needed her face and body and nose and hair to be perfect. So she had exceedingly high standards of her performance on Instagram. Perfectionism is also characterized by number two, concerns about making mistakes. So this is where someone ruminates and worries about making mistakes. Um, she, w- the client was very worried about losing her audience on Instagram, and she really ruminated and remembered all the different times that she had made a mistake on Instagram. Uh, number three, uh, lastly, perfectionism is characterized by concerns about the social consequences of not being perfect. So with this client, she was very worried about being rejected by people on the internet, being seen as a hack or being thirsty on Instagram or something. So as some of you might already detect is there's a lot of overlap between perfectionism and other concepts that I've talked about, namely narcissistic personality disorder, avoidant attachment, this kind of thing. Um, And there is, there's some overlap, but but not tremendous. It's, It's not like, I would say that perfectionism is probably 20% overlapped with narcissism. So there are plenty of perfectionistic people that I would not put on the narcissistic narcissistic spectrum. So again, as I was talking about earlier, the internet has a lot of really funny things to say about perfectionism. You know, top 10 signs that you're a perfectionist, and then it'll just be like these really minor issues. Lots of celebrities are labeled as perfectionists. Um, Daniel Craig, Eminem, Gwyneth Paltrow, Beyonce, Adele, Steve Jobs. As I said, Madonna, Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian seems to be labeled with everything. She seems everyone on the internet di- has diagnosed her with everything. I imagine Donald Trump and you know Hillary and Obama have a similar uh, fate. 
um, basically all these people in the articles that I read were people like Eminem has, you know, he's a perfectionist. Again, it's not a DSM diagnosis, so it's fine to throw that word around for the most part. Uh, in the, I'm not as upset about people throwing around the word perfectionism as I am about people throwing around narcissistic personality or antisocial or psychopathy or sociopath or something. But, but anyway, that people seem to not be in line with the literature in that they basically just look for any performer who really cares about their product and labels them as a perfectionist. Eminem and Beyonce, these performers are, you know, they're very interested in making sure that they're, their art is is good, and because that's what people want, that people want a good, uh, you know, product, and, and they really care about their art. And so just because someone really cares about their art doesn't necessarily mean they're perfectionist. Um, it could very well mean that they are, but, you know, it could also just mean that they're just a really good artist and they really care about their art, and that doesn't mean you're a perfectionist. Perfectionism, again, you have to have excessively high standards for yourself. You know, Beyonce uh, really caring about her next album and, you know, spending a year or two on that album uh, and putting in, you know, good work but not breaking her back over it, I wouldn't call that excessively high standards. I would just call that like, well, that's kind of like her job, isn't it? And she cares about her art. So you really need to have like excessively high standards where, where most people would be like, Oh, come on. Like you're, you're not going to achieve that. You know, that's not going to happen. You know, um, you know, some of you might already be saying that about me. It's like, come on, Kirk, like there's a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, the chance that you're going to produce the definitive episode on perfectionism, that, that's pretty excessive, don't you think? And so I would agree with that. Um, you also need to have like excessive concerns about making mistakes. Again, if you're Eminem and you're making your next album or something, and you're, you know, you, you don't want to make mistakes, but you just have the normal range of worry about making mistakes and the normal range of doing things to account for uh, mistakes, then you're not a perfectionist. You, you, no one wants to make a mistake, you know, right? So you really have to have excessive concern about making a mistake. Um, and also you need to have excessive concern about the social consequences of not being perfect, uh, to the point where you really suffer, you know. Um, for example, Stanley Kubrick is a good example of this. Uh, now, maybe Eminem and um, you know Beyonce and all the others, maybe they're maybe they do suffer from it. But I, I in the articles that were written about them, they didn't give any evidence like this. But with Stanley Kubrick, you actually do see this perfectionism um, uh, construct at play. If you're not familiar with Stanley Kubrick. Um, Google him. He has directed um, some of my favorite movies, uh, most namely uh, Clock, A Clockwork Orange, 2001 Space Odyssey, um, Barry Lyndon, uh, other movies like that. So he was, uh, and The Shining, for example, he was famous for uh, being a perfectionist and suffering from his perfectionism. He wasn't just a director who, you know, really cared about his, his movies he cared too much and people around him would say, Stanley, you care too much. You're, you're, you're ruining your life because you care too much. Like if you just ratcheted it down a little bit, people would still love your movies. In fact, they might like them more and you wouldn't be suffering so much. And he was famous for shooting many, many takes just to get things right. For example, in the, in the, the shining, he broke apparently a world record by shooting the same scene 148 times. <laughs> so, and I think it's just this little scene between the old man who has the psychic powers and the kid. There's, there's just a conversation they're having like in the kitchen or something. And when I watch this scene, I'm like, that's the scene that took 148 takes. Cause it seems so silly that you, you would need to do that that many times. But Stanley Kubrick was so concerned and so consumed with the anxiety about making a mistake and not having the shots be perfect that he was like, no, we're going to do it again. Just imagine that being an actor or being anyone on that set 148 times. That probably took several days, I'm guessing. I don't know. And you're just like, again, 
we're going to do this again. And haven't we got it yet? Like, uh, so, you know, there was that. And he reportedly, again, suffered a lot and had to take several years off from making films uh, because he was paralyzed with the fear of making a mistake. Stanley Kubrick is, um, I think, semi-famous for the fact that there's blocks and chunks of time where he wasn't making any movies. When when he, people were just like, you know, so hungry for another movie from him. You know, t- today, you know, like Damien Chazelle and uh, Denis Villeneuve, you know, and another uh, uh, Villeneuve, Bel- um, the other directors, they, you know, they make a movie every couple years. Well, Stanley Kubrick in his time was like mega famous. He was one of the big ones, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, this kind of thing. And to not have anything come out was very strange. And that was because he was, uh, you know, in essence, metaphorically in a fetal position, uh, terrified by fear of, of making a mistake. And so, so he's a good example of an actual uh, famous person who suffered from perfectionism. Again, just because you're Madonna and you really care about your performances doesn't mean you're a perfectionist in terms of the clinical literature. Um, apparently, Winston Churchill talked about perfectionism. He said, the maxim, nothing but perfection, may be spelled paralysis. So I don't know if this is just the internet lying to me that Winston Churchill said this, but any, anyway, Winston Churchill recognized that, look, um, if you strive for perfection, then you're going to be paralyzed because it's, you know, too hard to achieve perfectionism and the anxiety that is accompanied, uh, that accompanies the striving for perfectionism will cause you to not do anything. All right, so what's the prevalence of perfectionism? Well, there's not much research, um, but of the research available, it seems like it, it might be fairly prevalent. For example, one study of uh, grade school girls found that 25% of them showed signs of perfectionism. And anecdotally, I would say that that figure is probably about right. I would say about 25% of people have some form of perfectionism, where whether or not it's beneficial or destructive, I would say that they're, they're probably somewhere on that uh, spectrum. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, not quite sure. But when I think about all the people around me and the clients I've worked with, I would say that as far as the definition of perfectionism that I work with and that a lot of other researchers work with, I would say that a, a good portion of people actually do suffer from perfectionism. And, I, and t- most typically what I find is that of the perfectionists that I know clinically and personally, most of them are actually in the paralysis phase where they are not doing anything because they're terrified of making a mistake. There, there are a lot of closet perfectionists out there that I know of who are, um, re- they really want to make something. You know, they, they want to be a painter. They want to be a perf- photographer. They want to be a singer. They want to change their jobs. They want to do better at school. They want to do, they want to ha- have a better yard. They want to have a better house or whatever the thing is. You know, they're, they're really consumed with those thoughts, but they're so demoralized with low self-esteem or something that they never actually take actions or, or they rarely take action along those lines. They would frame it as they're procrastinating or they're being lazy, but really what's happening is they're paralyzed with perfectionistic ideas, you know, that they think, ooh, you know, I, I should work on that thing. And then they get a little bit down the road and they suddenly realize, oh my God, what if I screw up? What if no one likes this? What if this is mediocre? What if this ends up being really bad? And then they have this tremendous amount of worry about that. And then they get, they stop, you know, cause like me, when I'm making podcasts, when you're terrified, it's hard to do anything, right? It's hard to do anything, particularly when it comes to artistic creative, you know, creative expression. It's hard to um, concentrate on that when you're do- when your brain is dominated by worry uh, of any kind, let alone, you know, worry of perfectionism. So yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about 
the four different perspectives of perfectionism. I want to provide some other stories. I'm going to talk about Umberto for a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about the history of perfectionism and outcomes. There's a lot of good and bad outcomes of perfectionism. I want to talk about the different measures. You know, in psychology, we have different psychological measures, psychological tests for perfectionism, uh, which illuminate different dimensions of perfectionism uh, or different types or different uh, aspects. There's a, lo- there's a lot of really great research looking at the different aspects of perfectionism. I want to look at the causes. There are a number of different causes I want to get into. Temperament, personality, gender socialization, parenting, school environment, sports environment, culture, etc. I want to so that you know what what causes people, uh, particularly parenting. Parenting is a big cause of of perfectionism. I want to talk about you know some other random things: imposter syndrome, uh, sexual perfectionism. And then I want to go into the treatment and maybe even the self-treatment of perfectionism. Welcome to the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. This episode is just for patrons of the podcast. So if you're not a patron of the podcast yet, if you want to hear this full episode, along with hundreds of other deep dives into various topics, you have to become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. When you become a patron at patreon.com, you will get instructions on how to access all of our patron-exclusive episodes. So do that now, and you will probably not regret it, because these episodes are perfect, as I always hope that they will be. (laughs) 